Rebecca Corium vanished from a cruise ship off the coast of Mexico. And now lost at sea 5,000 miles from home. And now lost at sea 5,000 miles from home. 5,000 miles from home. Rebecca Corium, a young British woman from Chester, England, was excited when she landed her dream job as a youth activity worker aboard a cruise ship employed by a well-known, family-friendly organisation we shall refer to as the Mouse Company. Rebecca loved working with children and travelling to different places, so it really was the ideal job for the 24-year-old Brit. She was a cheerful, friendly and adventurous young lady who was loved by both her colleagues and the guests aboard the ship she worked on. But on March 22, 2011, she mysteriously disappeared from the ship as it sailed near the coast of Mexico and she was never seen again. Rebecca was last seen on CCTV footage at around 5.45am, wearing large, ill-fitting clothes that seemed like they belonged to a different person. She appeared distressed and was talking on one of the ship's internal communications phones, meaning that she was talking to someone else on board the ship. A young man walks up to her to check if she's alright, and although there's no sound, she can reportedly be seen mouthing the words, yeah, fine. She then hangs up the phone and walks out of the camera's view. And that was the last time anyone saw her alive, or so it's claimed. A few hours later, she failed to show up for her shift at the kids' club. Her colleagues tried to contact her through the ship's intercom system, but got no answer. They checked her cabin and found no sign of her. They then alerted the captain, who ordered a full search of the ship, but Rebecca was nowhere to be found. The US Coast Guard and the Mexican Navy were informed, who launched both aerial and maritime searches of the area where the ship had been sailing. Mouse Company officials also contacted Rebecca's parents, Mike and Anne Corium, who lived in Chester, England. They informed the Coriums that their daughter was missing, and that they would fly them out to Los Angeles, where the ship was due to dock. It was quarter to eleven um, in the evening, just getting set to go to bed, really, and the phone rang. And they said, well, have to inform you that your daughter's missing at sea. That was the start of the nightmare. After three sleepless nights, Rebecca's parents arrived at the port in Los Angeles on the 25th of March, just in time to see the passengers disembark from the huge ship. The Coriums had hoped that they may have been given the chance to speak to some of the passengers, but Mike and Anne were kept at a distance, in a car with blacked out windows. After everyone had disembarked, the couple were taken on board where they met the captain, who expressed his deep condolences and his belief that Rebecca had been swept overboard by a rogue wave. They were then taken to a room that quickly filled with mouse company executives. The girl Rebecca had spoken to on the phone at 5.45am was also present. Mike and Anne were then shown the CCTV footage of Rebecca's last moments, talking on the internal phone and looking distressed. The executives then repeated the belief that she had probably been swept overboard by a rogue wave while on deck 5, in a private area of the ship only accessible to crew members. Unfortunately, and understandably, the Coriums hadn't slept for days and had not eaten for a long time. They were jet-lagged after their trip and obviously just wanted to get to the ship as soon as possible. But as a result, the meeting that day was all a bit of a blur, and by their own admission, they didn't do a very good job of getting much information, but they assumed they would have plenty of chances and lots of time in the future. How wrong they were. While the Coriums were on the ship, they also had a chance to meet with Superintendent Paul Rowley, the police officer assigned to investigate the case. Astonishingly, the whole case was to be investigated by this one single officer who had been flown in all the way from Nassau in the Bahamas 
1,500 miles from where the incident took place. Because the ship was registered in the Bahamas, by law it meant that any investigation would be conducted by the Bahamian authorities rather than those from the UK or the United States. UK police had no power to investigate. Maritime law says jurisdiction in potential crimes far out at sea falls to the country where a ship is registered. The flag of convenience here, as it's called, was the Bahamas. One Bahamian police officer was flown in. He questioned only six people in an investigation which lasted just hours. No passengers were approached at all, and only a few of the staff were questioned. But not much else is known about his inquiries and how much investigating he did or did not actually do. With the briefness of the visit and the seemingly shallow depth of the investigation, to the casual observer it seemed very much like his presence was due to legal obligation and procedure, rather than actually getting to the bottom of the mystery. Frustratingly for the Coriums, Superintendent Rowley returned home the day after he arrived. Ultimately, it was concluded that Rebecca must have accidentally been swept overboard from the staff area of Deck 5. But the only real evidence, if you could even call it that, was a pair of flip-flops found on the deck, which they assumed belonged to her. The flip-flops were present. She was not. Obviously, she was swept overboard, they reasoned. That was the story, and that's what they stuck to. The crazy thing is, the Coriums later realised that the flip-flops in question were the wrong size for Rebecca. Not just that, but the name and cabin number written on them proved they belonged to someone else. One could speculate that perhaps those flip-flops belonged to someone who was also present that morning. Someone that had something to do with Rebecca going missing. Or you could instead speculate that perhaps the footwear was planted to try and give the official explanation, more credence. Many people would argue that perhaps the footwear was simply left behind the day before and had nothing to do with the potential crime scene at all. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any publicly available information as to whether the owner of the flip-flops was ever identified or questioned. So let's explore the official explanation a little further. Let's suppose for a moment that although the flip-flops were not Rebecca's, she had in fact been swept off deck 5 by a freak wave. Despite the ship being covered in CCTV cameras, it's claimed no footage was caught of Rebecca going overboard to verify the explanation. And despite the very prominent position on the front of the ship, with many windows looking down upon the deck, it seems no one saw anything happen either. And as for the claim that a freak wave was responsible, there were no reports of any such weather and sea conditions in the area they were sailing at the time. Now take a look at this image. You can clearly see the ship is absolutely huge. With the length given online as 984.58 feet, you can work out the distance from the waterline to the ledge of Deck 5 is around 70 feet. For comparison, the north face of the White House is 60 feet and 4 inches high, not even tall enough to reach the side of the ship Rebecca was supposedly swept away from. A freak wave of this size and magnitude would have certainly shown up on CCTV elsewhere on the ship. Other people would have seen it too. Everyone on the ship would have felt the impact. Damage would have been caused and it would have been a huge deal. Not some quick and silent assassin that caught Rebecca unawares and whipped her off deck five by unfortunate accident. And if you look again at the private area where this supposedly happened, you can see there are walls surrounding that must be at least six feet high. Needless to say, the freak wave theory was a very dubious explanation for her disappearance. There was a short period of speculation and interest the month after she went missing, when activity was logged on Rebecca's credit card. Media outlets such as ABC7 News, the BBC, 
and numerous newspapers reported on the developments after her parents received an email from Rebecca's bank reporting financial activity on her account. Rebecca's father Mike said, This could be a very significant development. The fact that her credit card's been used could only mean someone has stolen it or she's still alive. The exact details were kept closely guarded and were given to the authorities to investigate. Strangely, we couldn't find any updates on this particular bit of information, which is a shame. It seemed like it could have been an important development in the case. Almost one year after her disappearance, Rebecca's dad received an email from a lady who believed she may have seen Rebecca with a dark-haired man while in Venice the previous August. This would have been around five months after she went missing. The woman specified that she was 85% sure it was Rebecca and that seeing the family's missing person appeal website had jogged her memory. Sadly, this information never provided any actionable leads and while some people believe it's proof that Rebecca ran away to start a new life or even that she was a victim of trafficking, the sighting in Venice was more than likely just a case of mistaken identity. In October 2011, seven months after Rebecca's disappearance, John Ronson, a journalist for the Guardian newspaper, took the same cruise on the same ship to try and get some more answers to the mystery. Several crew members that he spoke to had been aboard the ship that fateful day back in March when Rebecca went missing. Unsurprisingly, they all requested to remain anonymous, no doubt in fear of the repercussions of them speaking out. Several of them believed more was known about Coriam's fate than had been publicly disclosed or the company was telling them. One particular exchange the journalist had with a man working behind a drinks bar was quite telling of the situation. Here's an extract from the article. Were you on board when Rebecca Corium vanished? I ask. He narrows his eyes. I don't know anything about it, he says. There's a long silence. It didn't happen, he says. He looks at me. You know that's the answer I have to give. However, there was a maintenance worker that the journalist spoke to, who seemed to agree with the official narrative that she had been swept overboard, even going as far as mentioning the flip-flops that were found. Other crew members were convinced that Rebecca had jumped willingly, knowing that it would be the end of her. One of them believed that Rebecca was on the phone to her girlfriend that morning and they were having a fight. They believe her emotions got the better of her and she ended herself as a result. Another theory put forward by one of her friends was that maybe Rebecca had climbed up somewhere she shouldn't have in an attempt to feel like she was off the ship for a few moments and then accidentally fell into the water in a moment of absent-mindedness. Regardless of the different theories that the crew members had, the Guardian article gives the impression that the majority of them seem to agree that firstly, the whole ship was absolutely covered with CCTV cameras, and secondly, the mouse company knew more than they were letting on. The weeks and months following Rebecca's disappearance were not just difficult for the Coriums, but incredibly frustrating too. There seemed to be a complete lack of transparency and accountability from their daughter's previous employer. No contact. No information. They were left completely in the dark and caught in that awful limbo, only truly known by those who have experienced the disappearance of someone close to them. The Coriums were outraged by this lack of transparency and accountability and sick of not knowing the truth. They hired private investigators, including Bill Anderson, a specialist investigator, and maritime lawyer Jim Walker, to try and find out what really happened to their daughter. In his own words, Mr. Anderson was fully convinced something criminal had happened to Rebecca. Mr. Walker said, In this day and age, it is inconceivable that anyone would vanish from a cruise ship. 
particularly a ship catering to families and children, without the circumstances being recorded by closed-circuit television cameras. The Corium's local MP, Chris Matherson, immediately took an interest in the case when it was presented to him and shared his views with the BBC. I believe there's sufficient evidence to indicate that a crime may well have taken place. I'd like that investigated by the British police. My worst fear is that Rebecca Corium was murdered. Eventually, the report from the Bahamian police force was finally released to the Mouse Company, who then shared it with UK authorities. Unbelievably, this came with strict instructions not to disclose the contents of the report with Rebecca's parents. Despite repeated requests from the family and several freedom of information requests from their lead investigator, Bill Anderson, Cheshire police insisted that the report was not its property to share. I personally have never heard of such a thing. That's really got to be some high level legal jujitsu right there where the direct family of a missing person is denied the right to even look at the report. I can only imagine how infuriating it must have been for the family and for everyone on Team Corium. Rebecca's case is one of many that highlight the dark side of the cruise industry, where both crew and passengers are vulnerable to exploitation, harassment, violence and other unmentionable acts. The cruise industry as a whole has been accused of being secretive, uncooperative and negligent when it comes to dealing with cases such as these. It's also been criticised for having lax regulations and oversight, and for using flags of convenience not just for the tax advantages, but also to avoid legal responsibility. Over the years, the Coriums were tireless in their pursuit for truth. They also campaigned for changes to the law, and also for a new investigation to be conducted by UK authorities. The couple appeared in many interviews, both on TV and in the press, to tell their story and to spread their message. They continued very publicly up until some point in 2015, which is when they quietly agreed an out-of-court settlement for an undisclosed sum. As part of the agreement, they were no longer able to speak publicly about the case. Now, some people speculate that this was a sign of defeat, that accepting the settlement basically showed the Coriums had either finally accepted the official explanation, or that they accepted that Rebecca had purposefully brought about her own end. But the truth is, Behind closed doors, they were still pushing for a UK investigation and still campaigning back home, within the bounds of their agreement with the mouse company. With the Coriums, I feel like it was never about the money. And I'm sure most people will agree, no amount of financial compensation would come close to filling the hole left by the loss of a loved one. But I feel like the Coriums both deserved and needed the settlement money. Rebecca's dad, Mike, was a self-employed gardener. The family came from humble backgrounds and don't appear to be wealthy by any means. My belief is they needed that money to continue their campaign, to get to the bottom of what happened to their daughter and to do right by her memory. On the 26th of March, 2016, the Liverpool Echo newspaper revealed some important pieces of information regarding the case. The article discusses the fact that investigators believe the actions and body language Rebecca displays in the CCTV footage were indicating she was extremely unhappy about a recent incident. The article also mentions that Rebecca's parents believe she may have been involved in a violent struggle, evidenced by a ripped pair of shorts amongst the possessions returned to them after her disappearance. Most importantly, the article also mentions the fact that it was discovered the CCTV footage of Rebecca on the phone was actually recorded on Deck 1, even though Mouse Company officials always insisted the call took place on Deck 5, near the front of the ship where she was supposedly swept off from. Bill Anderson, the previously mentioned private investigator, 
says the explanation and location doesn't fit. Discussing the CCTV footage, Mr. Anderson is also quoted in the article saying, We think Rebecca is talking to a cabin mate about something awful that has happened. Our suspicion is, not long after this clip, she is thrown overboard. Obviously, the Coriums can no longer speak publicly after their settlement. But in recent years, the private investigation seems to have gone quiet too, with no new information or developments shared about the situation. Despite describing the report they were shown as totally and utterly unsatisfactory, Cheshire police were never able to proceed with their own investigation, on the grounds of lack of proper jurisdiction. Our thoughts go out to Rebecca's family and we hope that someday they can get the closure they deserve 